Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, on Roku Dwyer Boxing News. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let's talk about a few things. I'm going to get to the Wuldersich Chaknia fight short shortly, but let me address some sentiments that have been expressed by subscribers here on YouTube in the responses to some of these videos. First, let's talk about Sergio Martinez. Wow. Reading these comments, you would think that Sergio Martinez is on his deathbed with an IV attached. You know, Martinez, quite frankly, in his last two fights, has fought two unbeaten fighters. Right? He fights Julio Cesar Chavez Jr. He dominates the first 11 rounds of the fight. Folks, this is just the fight before last. He gets caught in the 12th round and has a bad 12th round. But an argument can be made that he won that fight by several rounds. By several rounds, I mean at least nine rounds. Right? I'm sure the Chavez Jr. corner knew that their fighter needed a knockout by the eighth round, right? And so that can only be categorized as a dominant performance. You know, it's really only because Martinez is a warrior that that 12th round is even competitive because some fighters would have simply waved at Chavez as Pernell Whitaker did a generation ago in waving at Chavez Sr., right? Instead, Sergio Martinez, being the warrior he is, tried to stay in the pocket and paid the price. Let's face it too. Chavez Jr. is one of boxing's harder punchers, right? Don't believe me. Just look at the post-fight interviews of some of the guys he has fought, right? You're going to find out that Chavez Jr. is a very heavy puncher. Also, it's questionable whether Chavez Jr. is even a middleweight because Chavez Jr. is a guy who gains 20 pounds after weigh-ins. And so, you know, fighters, experienced fighters who've been in against big punchers like Marco Antonio Rubio commented on the punching power of Chavez Jr. So I think YouTube Nation is being way too hard and looking at Martinez and saying, gee, he's over the hill. He's past his prime. He'd stand no shot against Janady Golovkin because of the Chavez Jr. fight. Let's talk about Martin Murray. Martin Murray, of course, was also unbeaten. Martin Murray, of course, fought for a title. It's debatable whether he lost that fight. Right? This is before he gets in the ring with Sergio Martinez. Now, against Martinez, the fight hung in the balance. Folks, how did that fight end? Sergio Martinez needed to deliver in the last two rounds. What did Martinez do? He delivered, right? If Sergio Martinez is supposed to be washed up, it's supposed to be several years past his prime, he's doing an awfully bad job of living up to that since in his last two fights, he's beaten two unbeaten fighters, one, by dominating that fighter for most of the fight and the second by actually coming back and closing the show when the show needed to be closed right my concern with Martinez is really a health concern he's had knee problems he's had some other problems he's undergone surgery you know the only question I have is whether he's fully back from ailments but I don't doubt that Sergio Martinez is still an elite fighter. In fact, I don't doubt that Sergio Martinez is still one of the very best in the sport, pound for pound. I personally consider it an open question on who wins a matchup between Martinez and Floyd Mayweather. And I consider Mayweather to be the top shelf. Okay, let's continue. Gavin Reese, Anthony Crolla. Now I'm hearing Gavin Reese is mulling retirement. You got to be kidding me. Look at Reese's record. Reese lost to Adrian Broner, and that was a bad style matchup, right? Let's face it. 
while Broner has a hard time finding guys and moving, we all knew Gavin Reese was going to come to him, right? That was a bad matchup for Reese. Reese comes back and fights Krola in what was a razor close fight. I know the guys on Sky had Krola winning by several rounds, even it seemed to me before the first round, right? I thought the scoring was ridiculous. But I'll say this even the Krola people have to concede that Reese can fight at a much faster pace than Krola, right? Gavin Reese has much faster hand speed than Krola. Really, Gavin Reese has only himself to blame for taking his foot off the gas in the championship rounds. If they fight again, anything can happen. But the one thing I do know is that Gavin Reese can set a pace that Krola can't set. Right? Gavin Reese has more options than Krola. So I want people to think about that fight carefully. Gavin Reese, it's not time to retire. It's rather time to look at your films and ask yourself how you can improve your strategy. Right? That fight was there for the taking. And let me say, I say this as someone who didn't make a pre-fight video on that fight. I'm not trying to explain a pick here. I'm just a fight fan who stumbled on the fight thought Gavin Reese had it in front of him and let it get away. Sometimes that happens, right? Now let's talk about a fight you need to know about because this fight was huge and it's not getting enough press. You had a huge fight in the cruiserweight division that just took place between champion Christoph Wolderchich, right? Christoph's a high wire act. He's losing to Danny Green. He comes back. He stops Danny Green. Right? He's that kind of fighter. But understand, this is a cruiserweight you need to know. Because somehow, he's getting better with every title fight. This is a guy who got the championship and who's actually improved his game while wearing the belt. And he fought the Olympic gold medal winner, unbeaten Rakim Chakiov, right? Huge fight took place in Moscow. Chakiov, and by the way, I know I'm butchering names. I apologize profusely to the fans of these fighters. I'm doing my best. But Chakiov is the better athlete, has the faster hand speed, explosive, has the faster foot speed. He was fighting in front of his home crowd. He got an early knockdown in the fight. Here's the problem. While Chakiev was the better athlete, this is boxing. He wasn't the better fighter. Wilderchic is the better fighter. This is a great fight. The video is up online. I suggest you take a look at it. This is a great fight between contrasting styles and just contrasting levels. Now let's just put it this way. Chakiev is a prototypical mid-range hooker. When you hear me talk about mid-range hookers, guys who throw hard hooks with both hands, seek and destroy guys, front foot guys, that's their game. This is exactly the kind of fighter I'm talking about. Right? Chakiev literally should have his picture in the dictionary next to the phrase mid-range hooker. Right? Now with all the great things that mid-range hookers have, in other words, you can't go left because the guy has a right hook, you can't go right, the guy has a left hook, Right? The guy is just a menace. Right? And of course, the guy has power and the guy is in your face the entire fight. For all the great things that mid-range hookers have, there are downsides. Uh, there are downsides. Let's downsize the style and let's also talk about the downsides to the style. Right? First, Chakiev couldn't fight inside. 
right? He's a mid-range hooker, not an up-close player, right? He's a mid-range hooker. He couldn't fight inside. Also, mid-range hookers, how do you put this? Um, they aren't defensively gifted. They tend to be offensive juggernauts, right? They tend to also lack some of the skills that the chess players one floor up have, right? For defense, Chakiov didn't use his hands to block punches. Didn't have a vertical game going where he's bending at the waist and being clever. In other words, he wasn't Frankie Gavin, a guy who's underrated from the UK, right? He wasn't an angles guy. What he did was he used his feet for defense. So he's mid-range hooking. Wildersich steps forward. Jackie F. would just move out of the way if things got heavy. Then, of course, he comes back in, and he's still throwing hooks, right? And, of course, mid-range hookers, like Chakiev, have a problem with pacing, right? You can be a great fastball pitcher, but if every pitch is a fastball, sooner or later the hitter is going to figure out the timing. I've found that the masters in the sport have different speeds, right? They'll throw a fastball, but even when they have a great fastball, they'll throw softer punches. They'll have other punches. Not everything's a hook. Sometimes it's a jab. Sometimes punches are just geared to get you in certain places. Other times, fighters will throw a lot of punches just to overwhelm you with volume to win the slow rounds. After all, this is boxing. Winning rounds matter, right? George Foreman, huge puncher back in the day. Foreman had a philosophy he talked about later in his career where in the early rounds, if he was fighting a guy who could move well, right? Foreman, even if he had an opening for that big right hand, would hold back a little of the hand because he thought when he was fighting Michael Moore that if he hit Moore with the full force of that right hand early when Moore was a hundred percent right that Moore might be able to get off the canvas would know about the right hand and then would stay away from it the rest of the fight so what Foreman would do is Foreman would hit you with let's say half of that right hand lead the other guy into believing that he could take the right hand. Lead the other guy into believing that he could be higher risk and stay in the pocket. What was the worst that could happen? He gets hit with the right hand that might daze him but that he could take. Of course the truth was that he couldn't take Foreman's right hand, not the full right hand, later in the fight when the opponent was a little bit more tired and when the opponent didn't have the recovery skills that he would have early. So Foreman claims against Moore. Huge fight when Foreman got the championship back. Foreman claims that he saw the right hand early in that fight. But didn't hit Moore with the full force of it. So that later in the fight, rather than stay away from Foreman, Moore is hanging around. Then Foreman, of course, dropped the bomb. Now that's the top shelf. Chakiev at 16-0 going into this Wildersich fight wasn't there. He's throwing home run fastballs from the opening bell. Right? So you know what happened. He has some success, but Wildersich is superior defensively. Think about an elite fighter. More times than not, elite fighters have defense. Wildersich literally is there just trying to brave the storm. He's just trying to survive until Chakiov punches himself out. And of course, Chakiov is predominantly on his front foot, right? There's no mystery where he's going to be. He's on his front foot. 
The only time he takes a step back is when things get a little bit too hot. So you know what happens. Wildersich does get knocked down, gets back up, but he's blocking most of the punches. Why? Mid-range hookers are throwing it from the outside. Right? Chakiev isn't throwing too much inside here. So Wildersich is blocking punches outside. He has a tight defense. Then, of course, the challenger starts to slow down. So what happens is the superior fighter, the champion, Wildersich, starts landing very short counters, right? Chakiev doesn't know what to do, right? This is the opposite of mid-range hooking, where I'm throwing wide punches. Wildersich starts throwing very short punches. His left hand, even though he's a righty, up front can knock you out. The fight's brilliant because Wildersich starts landing heavy, well-placed shots. He can't match Chakiev in athleticism, hand speed, foot speed, or volume. But he's vastly superior in terms of technique. You have a technician against an athlete. Let me point out too, the skill level is so different that the two guys are in a clinch at one stage. Chakiev doesn't know how to clinch properly. So what happens before the break on the clinch? Wildersic is able to just take a step back, throw a left hand, and drop him. Right? Let's just say Chakiev doesn't make it to the ninth round. He is finished. Doesn't have the defense, quite frankly, to deal with Wildersic's timed shots. Wildersic is not there trying to win on volume. He's just trying to time you and hit you with short counters. Right? Even after Chakiev gets up after being dropped at the end of the break, he has no hope. Because, of course, he doesn't have the defense to block Wildersich, right? He himself doesn't know how to fight inside like Wildersich, right? Wildersich is throwing short punches, right? Punches that Chakiev doesn't have the time to get out of the way of. He can't rely on his athleticism to block the short punches, right? One of the knockdowns is a Wildersich right hand. The rest are lefts. All of them are short, right? The challenger is completely out of gas by the eighth round. This fight is a masterpiece. I hope you give it a look. Wildersich right now, I used to be a skeptic. He's come a long way from losing to Steve Cunningham. Right now, this guy is an elite fighter. He's mentally tough. Understand he's that rare type of fighter who can travel to Australia and beat Danny Green in a fight he was losing before the stoppage there. And then he travels to Moscow against the Olympic gold medalist. Gets dropped early. Gets off the canvas against a superior athlete and then defends his title. In my opinion, you should give this fight a look. Let me hear from you. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Again, this is Christoph Wildercic against Rakim Chakiev. Big time fight that took place in Moscow. Let me hear from you. Thanks for watching.